So we have partners. We have oh, partners I'm, like, I'm, oh, that's I'm perfect. <laughs> We have partners like Vitamix uh, who sell our units directly to consumers as well as uh, several school programs, but I'm here tonight to speak about our municipal programs. So through these programs, we help municipalities divert more food waste and reduce greenhouse gas emissions associated with food waste. And as of today, we're partnered with 43 municipalities who are all in different stages of their programs right now. 42 of our partners are in Canada, and we're very proud to be traveling to Seattle tomorrow to launch our first U.S. program. And so now, as you all know, that you know food waste is a major problem, and households are very large producers of food waste. You know, it's avoidable, it's smelly, it's made up of mostly liquids. So for you and I, it freezes in the winter, making it very heavy. On top of that, food waste decomposing in landfills is responsible for generating methane, which is about at least 25, uh, 25 times worse than CO2 um, when it comes to global warming potential. And of course, this contributes to climate change, uh, the climate change that we're seeing today. And so all of these factors make it so that food waste is a major problem for municipalities. So whether the impacts be costs, environmental, social, Food waste is a problem and it's important that we do our best to find sustainable ways to deal with it. And so we often get asked, you know, haven't we solved this already? And while there are options available like green bins, which up here in Canada, millions of people are accustomed to, but this type of service is really popular in larger cities with high population densities and the financial investment for this type of service is quite substantial. And many people in your community might backyard compost, which we love, we think it's fantastic. But the reality is that many people don't have the space, the ability or the desire to do this at home. Um, so, and participation rates are pretty stagnant. And finally, to continue landfilling or organics is not sustainable, whether that be for environmental um, reasons or from an, a financial point of view. And so what we've done is we've proposed a different way to deal with food waste, which really focuses on making food waste easy to deal with right in our homes. We've built a small kitchen appliance about the size of a bread machine where you put your food waste in the bucket and that can include meat, poultry, fish, dairy, you name it. You push a button and in a matter of hours, you have the dry, sterile, uh, odorless, nutrient-rich soil amendment that, uh, that comes out. And I'll speak more about this actual byproduct in a few moments, but instead of just speaking about how the technology works, um, I'm going to go ahead and show you a video. I'll have to stop share and then reshare the video. I'll go right ahead and do that. So let me know if you can see the video and um, there should be sound uh, here, I'll just... And um, you are also the first to see this video. This is a brand new video that our marketing team has finally let me use today. So I will go ahead and play it. There is great comfort and peace of mind in knowing where my food comes from. But where does it go? The waste, the peels, the pits, the stems, the half-eaten leftovers. What if there was a solution that puts you in control of your household's food waste? where you could turn your family's food scraps into something more. More food, more plants, more life. What if you could starve the landfills and feed the earth instead? Food Cycler Maestro, the indoor food waste recycler, does just that. It's a convenient alternative to composting. Because of Vortec, its unique grinding technology, the Food Cycler Maestro breaks down even the toughest of food scraps my dependable helper that's become part of my everyday. It's easy to use, odorless, quiet, convenient, and energy efficient. Creating a nutrient-rich soil amendment in hours that goes back into the earth or can be stored for later use. It's a simple way to make a big impact for my family, for my community, for myself. The future of food waste starts here. Okay, so I will go back to the presentation quickly. Okay, can you see my screen? 
Thank you. Um, sorry. There we go. And so, like you saw in the video, the byproduct is generated in about four to eight hours and uses little energy. And we have two residential models, which I'll briefly describe at the end um, of the presentation. But I wanted to add that we don't call the finished product compost. Um, composting, of course, is a process that is done by mi microorganisms uh, that feed off the carbon in the organic matter. Uh, the byproduct essentially accelerates the composting process because it is already so pre-processed um, that it has such a high surface area that essentially increases the bioavailability of carbon. Um, so once you reintroduce it into the soil, it's easier um, to put in very simple terms for the microorganisms to kind of get that composting process going. Um, so we're careful to not, you know, claim that it, this makes compost, um, but it does deal with food waste and uh, really accelerates the composting process. And so very briefly from an environmental standpoint, the food cycler is comparable to backyard and central composting uh, before taking in transportation, transportation emissions. Uh, it represents an approximate reduction of greenhouse gas emissions by about 95% compared to sending your food waste to landfills. And in terms of an economic impact, our solution offers a return on investment by significantly reducing your waste management costs. So in this case, the village of Rybrook would be saving on tipping fees. And given that food waste makes up about 30 to 50% of household garbage, uh, you could be saving up to half on your tipping fees. And so one thing we've learned from working with municipalities is that residents are very interested in being part of the solution. You know, they want to try new things, they want options. And with the food cycler, you get to bring something new and innovative to your residents who might not otherwise be participating in a diversion uh, program. So we think it's really all about giving people the right tools. And so I mentioned earlier that we're working with several municipalities and this number is a little bit out of date. I'll have to update it, um, but we, tend to start with pilot programs. And we found that that works really well. So it allows municipalities to try out the solution, see how it works for them, see how the residents respond to the solution. And just to give you an example, the city of Nelson, BC um, has voted to put a food cycler in every home. So that'll be their sole food waste um, solution going forward. And so here's just briefly the general structure of our pilot programs. We track how much food waste is diverted throughout the program, and we're then able to provide a report to the municipality. And so in the video, the woman was using the Maestro, which is our new model. We have two residential solutions. The FC30 is what we've offered for many years now. It's our true and tested um, model. Uh, the Maestro is set to be ready in a few months. Um, and as you can see here, the Maestro is larger. They both process food waste um, and they have different price points. Um, and we've had discussions with Chris and Greg about our pricing models, um, but usually in Canada, the municipality provides a subsidy and then shares the cost with residents. Um, and we also provide uh, an investment that is significantly reduced from retail. Um, but we're finding through our efforts in the US that a different mo model might be more effective in the US. Um, so through our municipal programs, we've worked hard to get to a price point that's significantly discounted from the retail price like with Vitamix. Um, but of course, these details are up for discussion um, but uh, yeah, we would welcome the village of Rybrook to, to be a part of this initiative as we believe your community will be a great fit for the benefits of this program. And uh, once again, I'd like to thank you for allowing me to present to you tonight. If there are any questions, I would be happy to take them. Yeah, I just have one quick question. Um, just because you know the compost program that we're in right now. So does does this is this only um, vegetable products? Is it only green? Thank you for your question, Mr. Mayor. Um, so the food cycler takes pretty well anything. Um, the only thing we recommend not really putting in are thick beef bones. You can put meat, poultry. You can put dairy, fruits, veggies. Um, it's uh, it really takes takes everything. Thank you for your question.
And how long did, uh, how often did you say that a household, you know, let's say a household of four people on average has to use it, like accumulates that much food waste to run it? Yes, thank you for your question. So it depends on how much food waste is produced. A household of four people could run a cycle once a night, kind of, you know, started at night like a dishwasher um, or every few days. As you keep using the food cycler, you definitely become more conscious of your food waste. So I would say over time, maybe every few days. How much energy do these use when they're operating? So every cycle consumes about 0 0.8 kilowatt hour of energy, uh, which is about the same as having a laptop plugged in for the same amount of time. Uh, the Maestro is a little bit more at about up to 1.5 kilowatt hour. Um, yeah, thank you for your question. Um, I had a couple of questions. I wrote them in the chat, but I'll just read them. Um, where does the water go? Does it electrically just dry up in there? So that it's yes. dry? Sorry, yes, um, it does. It, so it dries up the food waste and then it drying is the first stage and then it grinds it up. Um, so it totally dehydrates the food waste, exactly. And the other question is, I don't know about other people, but we put a lot of paper towel and shredded um, paper into our compost. Does that work with this too, or is that separate? It certainly does work uh, in the food cycler. You know, the only thing, there are bioplastics available on the market where we don't recommend people composting that. Um, whether that those things are compostable is is certainly up for debate, but uh, paper towels uh, and shredded paper works wonderfully. So it sounds like everything that we are composting would go in this. Exactly, yes, yes. Except some of the harder stuff like the bones and things yes. like that. Yes, yes, sorry, the bones, bones. yes. And Except pits. for the large bones. And pits. Uh, pits, uh, it depends on the pit. Um, Someone, for example, a wow. client put uh, a bunch of cherry pits, like a whole bucket or half a bucket. And so that was really difficult to, for the grinder, um, but it can take uh, things in moderation, like pits in moderation, not a full bucket of pits, but if you mix it up, it's pretty sturdy. And you said no to like beef bones, but chicken bones or also no? <laughs> Chicken bones and fish bones are perfectly fine, yes. Okay. Thank you for your question. Are there any other questions? I'm just uh, curious, so any municipalities currently piloting or testing out the uh, program? Yes, thank you for your question. We have 42 municipalities in Canada that are currently either piloting or they're beyond the piloting stage. Um, and then we have our first US municipal partner uh, in Washington state. And we're actually traveling there tomorrow to go launch it this weekend. So yeah, 43 in total right now. Oh, I have one more question. Are the prices Canadian dollars or American dollars? Thank you for your question. Those prices were in US dollars. So one of the things we were talking about just for consideration, because um, a lot of it is this cost sharing programs that they're doing in, in Canada, um, at least in the New York area, one of the things we that we were talking about in our meeting was, you know, we usually cannot provide, we can't purchase things and give it to the residents that way. So, you know, because that's like a gift to public funds. So whether that scenario would work here is, a, is, a, is something we'd have to talk more with legal about. But um, you know that that's that could be an obstacle in New York and under that type of uh, cost sharing program if that was available, you know, in terms of making it available, that that might be a different issue. Um, then we just have to talk about like sales tax issue because if we are issuing it versus they're purchasing it directly, you know, we had a dialogue about that. They may have to purchase it directly from 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 you guys to be able to and pay the sales tax because we you know you can't avoid paying sales tax for a product like that um in some communities they provide and i was trying to think of like an equivalent sometimes some communities they provide like garbage cans but technically they're the owner they're owned by the municipality when they give them out 
So there's still like, and that's why it passes on to the next person or the next property owner. So this is just open issues that would have to be resolved if the village moved forward. Thank you yes. so much. It was a very interesting presentation. It seems like a great product that a lot of people would like to use. Well, thank you so much for having me tonight. Um, and Greg, if there are any follow up questions, um, please send me an email and I'll be happy to uh, help you how I can. Sounds good. Thank you, Kazia, for joining us. But um, are there any last minute questions for her while we have her? Anybody has? Going once, going twice. All right. Yes, but yes, but if anyone does have any follow-up questions that they could think of um, tomorrow or the day after or whatever, um, yeah, Chris and I do, uh, Administrator Bradbury and I, I should say, do Chris, have, please, Chris. Uh, <laughs> after, um, on October the 6th, I believe, um, if I remember correctly. So um, again, if you're any of follow-up questions between now and then, again, please let myself or um, know and then I can forward them over to Kazia. Have a great rest of your meeting. Thanks. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Okie dokie. Great. Yeah. Yes. The second thing I want to touch on before we get into our main topic of tonight, which is our liquid electric leaf blowers, I just want to just give like a basic update on our proposed renovation by Hills Park. So I, for those of you who are not as familiar with it, so there is a butterfly garden by Hills Park that's maybe 15, 20 years old. I don't know the exact number, but um, so a student at Blindberg High School who was a senior uh, just called um, our office with some ideas in order to do some renovations to it just because he has a very personal uh, interest um, within the park, particularly within, he has a big interest in sustainability and particularly within butterfly gardens. So uh, we've had a meeting with him as well as um, with Bridget, as well as the Ministry of Bradbury and our Superintendent of Public Works and our Superintendent of Parks and Recreation, uh, just to kind of throw uh, them in on, on some things. But I do want to let Bridget kind of talk because Bridget, of course, is the opposite of me in the sense that she's really the expert on native plants, which I am the ever, anything but. Um, but we have had um, sustainability expert, uh, Christiane Yandetowitz, and who I cannot thank enough a um, hundred times over because then she's been very helpful to me and a lot of projects that I've helped um, uh, take part of here in the village. So Bridge, I'll turn it over to you. You can just uh, talk to all of us now that we have the mayor on and the rest of the committee, just some of the ideas that the student has and that you have and that Christina has for that butterfly garden. Yeah, so this butterfly garden, like Greg said, it was planted a long time ago, but it it's, hasn't been maintained at all. So all of the plants that were there are no longer there. So it's really just a patch of dirt with a couple like invasive bushes <laughs> really, um, which is the opposite of what we want. Uh, so it, it's just a nice space that we could potentially transform. And uh, with Christina's help, we might be able to do it at a low enough cost. The biggest issue really for us is the manpower. And that's what we're trying to figure out right now is how to schedule something like this, get volunteers because the area needs to be cleared then everything needs to be planted, but also we need people to help maintain it because like what happened last time, you can plant something, but if nobody's going in to like weed out the invasive vines or whatever happens to pop up, you know, then it ends up kind of going downhill and going away. So uh, we're hoping that we can get some residents, maybe even some students to like jump in and help with the planting and help maintain it uh, for the long term. Yeah, and that sums it up just about right. Um, so originally I had planned maybe to get some start some October. I don't think that, I'll be honest, that's going to happen. It might, it might be more likely something I'm going to push back towards the spring on. But, um, and I'll, of course, I'll let Administrator Bradbury jump in from his perspective. Um, but for me and the couple main things uh, here, at least the biggest issue that I foresee is the cost. I mean, this is not going to be cheap because a lot of these plants are a little expensive. And as Bridget said, is that we have to maintain it um, once it's done. So we definitely don't want to make it make it nice, but not to extravagant to the point where it's going to be a challenging um, for our parks and recreation staff to be able to maintain for hopefully years to come. Now, again, I would like to get like some of our uh, Blindbrook uh, students of Optically Roots and Shoots Club. Um, again, 
get, get them more involved, maybe they can help maintain it throughout the years. But of course, as the students get older and age out, they're not going to be the same ones. Um, but those are just some thoughts and ideas that we've had. Again, some so some of the ideas that, that the Ministry of Bradbury has brought up is that you know maybe we can have the Teamsters uh, help us out in Elmsford because at least in some funding aspect. But um, I don't want to uh, really uh, hold them to that. Uh, again, that necessarily a commitment. But um, I will turn it over to Mr. Bradbury if he, he, so he can chime in in his thoughts regarding this project. I think it's I think it sounds great. I mean, I, we went out and did the site visit. I think it's a wonderful thing to bring back. You know, it's it's I had no idea. I've been here for two decades and I didn't know there was a butterfly garden at one time there. So it uh, definitely could needs a lot of attention. You know, the highway staff is a skeleton crew. So our park staff is a skeleton crew. So it's hard, you know, if they're unless they're informed about more about it and maintain it and it has to be straightforward and so you know straightforward for them to maintain it, it becomes difficult certainly the roots and shoots club might be a good you know they seem very interested in a lot of programs it might be a good thing for their coordinator to put on a list that for like community service for whoever's that that year that year's class you know that might be a good way to work with them and not this as well as maybe we come up with a list of projects that they could have that would all be eligible for community service uh, that's geared for the mission of that particular club. So no, I think it's a great, it sounds like a great, it's a great idea. It's a great program. We're excited about it. And I think one thing I forgot to mention along with that is um, that there's also an educational aspect to it because part of what was in the butterfly garden or it's still there. It's the, I think it's the only thing that's still there is there's like a display with a poster of like different butterflies. Um, and we had talked about like turning the butterfly garden into like an example garden for residents and a place where people like we'd put a bench there where people can sit and have like the plants ID'd with, you know, tags on them. So we can make it something that residents can go to to also get inspiration and they can see butterflies, bees, birds, all that stuff, you know, the full life cycle of things going on, hopefully. Um, so it does have that aspect as well. Mary Klein, did you have a question? Was your hands raised? Yeah, no, just I'm, I'm very familiar with the area. Um, I actually, I know exactly where it is. And um, I think that, I think this is a, a great idea also um, just so that other people were also, so the county is going to be having what well, we're starting to put together through um, the, uh, uh, what is it called? Planting Westchester. So through Planting Westchester, we're starting to put together kind of a, a symposium on how you get, how you get volunteers to help uh, battle invasive species, because it's something that every municipality is dealing with especially in their natural areas. And I think this really would be a great project for a volunteer group to start getting some momentum of just some, some people and you'd be surprised. I mean, if we put a, a notice out there into the community that we're putting in this new butterfly garden and we're looking for people to commit an hour a week or something like that, there would be a lot of people that I think would sign up for it or at least you'd get 10 or 12 people even if it's just five, you have enough. I, I think it would be a great volunteer opportunity and we'd really rely. I don't think we could commit the resources for our DPW highway staff to really maintain this. I think this would have to be something that would have to be through a volunteer group. And maybe we could ask places like the senior center if they would want to offer that as like something for them and maybe they could drop off once in a while and it could be like an activity for them to do um because i know a lot of people live in places that they don't have gardens but they do like to garden so maybe that could be a way that we could get volunteers as well and of course the schools and everything else but i just want to ask again it's okay for you if the answer is no does everyone like no um First of all, like the, the part that we're talking about and the exact location that we're referring to? I didn't. So don't feel bad yeah, if you don't, because I had no idea where I was going. I was I like, didn't is either. the park here? <laughs> I don't know where it either. is in Rye Hills Park. I don't know where the butterfly garden was specifically within the park. I mean, there Rye were wildflowers before, like in Crawford Park, there's the area of wild, you know, wildflower area where they had the, um, where they put in the, the, Eagle Scout project. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so, uh, again, this is confusing even me. So I 
first started here, maybe my several first several months here. So Rye Hills Park is literally right next to Crawford Park. But as you all know, Crawford is run by the town of Rye, but we have a, a our own park that's right next to it that falls under the jurisdiction of, of course, us as the village of Rye Brook. Um, it's it is kind of hidden. I'll be honest. So again, if you haven't seen it before. Um, again, no one, I wouldn't blame you like, at all because again, I, I didn't even know it was there until the student brought it to my attention. But um, if you come up uh, by Hills from, and Mr. Rebbe, what, what's that name of that? Into that top, top, Hidden top. Falls. Yeah, Hidden like, Falls, yeah. If you come up through Hidden Falls, it's going to be right on your left. Uh, and that's where it is. Oh, yeah. It some of the plants there, again, are um, still around, but some of them you could say, definitely tell have died uh, over the years. I could probably honestly most of them. Uh, but again, Rye Hills is mostly like a dog walking park, and that's where you can play like pickleball or basketball. Yeah, we have a lot of, I mean, it's a busy park in terms of, well, not very busy, but it has, it's an active park. A lot of, do a lot of dog walkers go in there, a lot of people on and off leash, really. But there's also uh, courts there. We you know, pickleball is really popular there. We do a lot of pickleball, both recreation and our seniors. But like you, you said before, I certainly I'm very familiar with the park. I did not know there was a butterfly garden there. So um, there's the other, there's actually something else in that part that people don't realize, which is far off when you come in the main entrance, far off to the left. There's actually a was a grant for a viewing area there. Here are you. I forget what's in there, but it's basically like an area for like educational opportunities and things like that, where people can sit around or go in like a, a little arbor there. So it's a little, it's interesting if anybody, it, it probably needs more attention, but um, that was created, you know, 30 years ago. Right, I don't know if you want to pull up a map, you could do that if you want, it's up to you on shared screen if you know how to do that. Let me see if I find one. No, now I'm on Google Maps. Can everyone see my screen first of all? Just like making sure that everyone okay, is visible. All right, let me see if I can pull up, find a good visual for you somewhere here. Here, Greg, you know what? If you put it down, I have Google Maps already up. You want to just let me share mine? Well, let me just give you a share screen opportunity. Yeah. All right, we're good to go. That's not working. Nah, it's not letting me share it like I do at home, like I do at work. And the way I got to it was I parked at um, Crawford. Crawford. Sorry, losing my voice, <laughs> which is not a good time. Um, I parked at Crawford Park, and where Debbie was saying the wildflower garden is to the side, you literally just follow that trail until you see a wall that has an opening and it looks like a secret garden. You're like, what is this? And then you walk through and just go straight. And that's the other park on the other side of that wall. And then if you walk straight, that's where the butterfly garden is, which you wouldn't really know it's a butterfly garden, but that's where it is. <laughs> so, but they really are right next door to each other. So it's on the left. If you're continuing that direction on the path toward like the pagoda or the area that Chris was mentioning, it's it was on the left-hand side, the butterfly garden. Yeah, yes, right okay. there. I'm there all the time. I just, 
also never noticed necessarily a butterfly. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I will look next time I walk into the park and see exactly where it is. Yeah, th that's the problem. There, there isn't a garden there. Right. There's actually a sign that has, if you look closely at it, it has a whole bunch of butterflies, um, pictures, but not a garden yet. Yeah, I don't remember seeing it, but I will definitely take a look in the next few days. I finally was able to pull something. I know it's a little fuzzy, but this is pretty much a general idea where it is. I can zoom out a little bit. Yeah, but, and that was it right there, right? The kind of yeah, this is exactly yeah. Right yeah. So we would be removing several of those large bushes because a few of them are invasive, or they're not. They're just not native. Um, we are keeping a couple as more decorative because they're not going to spread. You know, they're fine. Um, just to have like some more established plantings there. Um, and we are keeping the tree and that's where we thought we'd put a bench underneath so that people could sit. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a significant amount of space. Uh, it'd be the largest garden that we would have done so far if we do this project. Um, so there's definitely a lot of room to work with, uh, which when we talked with Christina, uh, she suggested we do a lot of, you know, we do some mature plants just to make it look fuller, but we would be planting a lot of baby plugs, like little baby plants, just because, as Chris said, we have to, and as Greg said, you know, the issue is going to be a budget, and so we need to stick to a budget, and then we also need maintenance, you know, have to have that maintenance, um, and to buy the amount of mature plants we would need would cost like thousands and thousands of dollars, uh, which we cannot afford. <laughs> so we're going to um, do it on a budget. Greg, go, can you go back to that screen again? So I just want to show you one thing here. So if you look, there's actually a great opportunity. Top left, Greg, could you just scroll so there? That's actually like an educational area where you could, kids could sit or you could have a program where you could teach people this or any other thing, any other type of educational program about the park or uh, anything you know in that area that we want to highlight. There's one area there that's meant to be an educational area. And then Greg, if, can you go south on this? And then there's another area out here. I think it's desperate here. Keep going, keep going. Which is another area that has an area that people can can come in and and uh, have a program that people don't know about that area. Often you just passed it. People right, often really don't know cool. about that area. But can you go to my left or my right? Just up. You were right that you were just passed it. Just for you. Keep going. It's right there. There's the other one. That's a sitting area as well. Mm -hmm. And that one's really kind of more hidden that people often don't know about. Wait, isn't this the, the part where you said you can, uh, maybe years ago, you could have gotten a good view of the sound before the shooting? Yeah, there used to be a view of the sound there. Oh, wow. Yeah, in, in the winter, you can see Porchester High School. Yeah. Like, on, the, on the leaves fall. Yeah, mm -hmm. direct shot at that. Yep. Thanks, Greg. Yeah, so it might be a really nice way to kind of bring some new life to the garden, bring some new people to the garden, <laughs> especially children, you know, um, so it could work for multiple purposes and also just be a relaxing spot for people to sit and look at butterflies, which is always nice. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, and again, this would be something that we, we wouldn't in no way would it be possible to get it done one day. So we would at least at the bare minimum, a couple different Saturdays of, of again, first clearing it out, which are again, our parks and, um, and highway staff have been helpful in that in the past. I'm sure we can um, ask them to do that again, but the planting itself might take a couple different um, attempts to get everything um, properly uh, situated in the ground. So I think where we left off, there was going to be like a layout put in, put on paper, and uh, and then we'll cost it out, and then it'll go to the board for for approval. Jason, does that make sense? That does that does make sense to me. I would certainly like to see the the plans before we move forward with anything. Mm -hmm. Of course, and is yeah. it possible? Oh, I have another question. Is question. it possible to get any corporate or business sponsorship for something like this? Yeah, one of the issues with no, probably, they, they, probably, <laughs> they probably want, I mean, I think it's definitely possible. Um, they probably would want to sign in there, and that's something the board would have to approve. Brandon Hills, Susan Johnson, 
Okay. Well, so, uh, Mr. Mayor, would that be something you'd be comfortable with? I know you're going to speak yourself personally here, but since you're here, just ask you your own personal opinion. I mean, my preference would be private donations if we could find some, um, you know, because I'd rather list names of residents who contributed to the project than a corporation. And, you know, I think we'd also have to talk about term. So, you know, okay, you, you gave the money to start this up, but how long is it, is it gonna help pay for maintenance? And, and what about that? But, you know, I think, I think it, can, it can be explored. And I had one other thought when we were talking about the maintenance. You know, there are things like the, um, like the soup kitchen programs and those types of things where the organ, the synagogue, the school, you know, community service, where they know that like once a week they're doing something, whatever that time frame is, and they sign up in advance and they make sure that they are committing to providing the food, you know, for the soup kitchen or so. Perhaps that's some way to get volunteers where people have a sign up over time, as opposed to, you know, a few individuals who are committing to doing it every single week. Maybe it's the kind of thing where, you know, community service or whatever at the school could, you know, know that that's one of their projects that I know it has to be managed, but that they sign up and, you know, they know that they're covering it, but say one, one week a month or something like that. Yeah, I think maybe if we could get like some sort of like online calendar on our sustainability website where people could sign up to take a shift or try to make it easy for people to see how they can volunteer in the garden, maybe that would make it easier. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing we did talk about for the garden is we did want to have a sign made if we could that says that it's a butterfly garden so people know what it is finally. And um, that's where we kind of thought that maybe if we had private donors, we could have their names listed underneath. Um, so I don't know how much they would have to donate. We haven't thought that far into it, but um, we did think about maybe creating some sort of campaign to get people in the village to uh, donate. Um, I don't want to keep interrupting them. Sorry. The um... One of the thoughts, I don't know what the time frame is in terms of coming up with a potential layout and uh, cost, but one of the things I'm thinking about is we, you know, we're, we participate in the Hudson Valley Greenway, maybe one of the Greenway grants, which is eligible, we're eligible for, which is environmental education. And this is, seems consistent with that. And uh, I know they usually have four deadlines through the year. I think the next one is in November, early November, and then usually it's like February next year something like in that time frame that might be that either one of those could be time you know something to think about yeah those would work because at this point because we don't we're probably not going to be able to do the full cleanup like we wanted to this fall we definitely aren't going to be able to plant because it's just going to be too late by the time we actually get that together to do it i think so that means we'd be starting really in the spring um mm -hmm. so we could definitely do like a grant in november or february that would leave us plenty of time i think mm -hmm. And we do have a grant writer that that will write any of this at no, no, we already pay a fee, a flat fee for as many grants as they write. So if they get the, we provide the information, they'll make, they'll apply it for us. Oh, so, amazing. Yeah, that'd be great. Cause that would really definitely help a lot if we could get some sort of grant for it. Mm -hmm. And there really isn't a timeline on the project. It's kind of, you know, <laughs> Yeah. Whenever it happens, whenever we are able to get together <laughs> everything, uh, because obviously it's a big project, we know that. So uh, it doesn't need to be rushed necessarily. Are there any other questions about the butterfly garden? Great. Uh, Greg, did you want us to move on to the leaf blowing? And if, again, if anybody does, does anybody have any comments they want to make about it before we move on? Wise, wise, wise. Okay, so yes, then now we'll guess we'll move on to the main topic of the night, which is uh, what well, we all know. Uh, so regarding our transition over to electric leaf blowers in some capacity, at least. Um, so I just want to say a couple things before again, I turn it back over to Bridget. So um, Bridget, myself, the mayor and our administrator, as well as our deputy mayor, did have a meeting with the New York State Landscape Association just so we can sit down with them as well. It actually was a very, I think, I think, I think the rest of us um, on the call would agree, a very productive conversation uh, to get, hear their concern, concerns and input. And you know, thank you, Bridget, for putting together the document that you did. 
Um, and then our ministry also spoke to our police chief today, just regarding some of the issues of abortion that he spoke to me about briefly. And then I, of course, um, I would definitely want to let him have uh, when he, uh, be able to discuss that with all of us, what the chief concerns are. But I would definitely, at this point, I want to turn it back over to you, Bridget, so you can get us started on, uh, I guess, first we want to talk about the meeting that we had. Um, and then we can go basically into the main substance, substance of what policy we all want. Yeah, so we had a meeting with uh, the Landscapers Association, which is actually went really well. Uh, they have their own sort of environmental advisor that's on their committee or whatever. I think they're a nonprofit. Um, and he had some advice about like ways that um, he would recommend doing it uh, and ways that would be most effective to like get landscapers to actually participate. Um, one thing I... Uh, I think he talked about, you know, he talked about having zones, which we would have, um, you know, like having green zones where it's next to a waterway areas like along those lines where you wouldn't want people blowing. Um, he didn't really mention as much about phase-ins, uh, but making it really simple and clear. And he was also mentioning that for him, and I'm going to say I did not double check this <laughs> information. Um, or I didn't fact check it, but um, for him, he was saying that there can be an environmental cost as well to the electric blowers. So he didn't find it as effective to say, oh, we're only allowing electric um, and no gas. Uh, but again, I didn't fact check that information. So, uh, and that's just because, you know, battery issues, all that sort of stuff, which we've discussed before. So um, the guidance that, we that I've put forward, of course, this is all things that can be adjusted, you know, it's not like a finalized thing Um, sort of goes along the lines of something that's really simple, easy to enforce, which that's the that was some of the concern too. is how do you enforce, um, you know, electric versus gas because they both make noise. So it's like people are going to call and be like, there's a blower going and then <laughs> they're like, no, but that's an electric one, not a gas, you know, so it's like trying to not cause headaches at first, but there can also be phases for this. Um, in the suggestions, we did look a lot to what Rye is doing and what they have implemented, um, just because they're the closest municipality that does have uh, a ban in place. I don't, and so we are using, um, like the, the dates, for instance, are the same as theirs. And I just think that makes it easier on the landscapers. And that's another thing that the landscaping uh, nonprofit that they recommended was, you know, try to streamline it with other places because it's really confusing when every single place <laughs> around all has different dates, different times, different, you know, this and that. And so if you can kind of go with what the place the places right next to you are doing it makes it easier uh because they don't have to try to remember like everything that's happening everywhere because the, as of right now there's not like a list like greg made uh with guidance that they have so they have to kind of find out on their own chris did you want to say something i thought you might want to I was uh, sure. no, 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 <laughs> clearly the the it was interesting yeah, it was definitely interesting to hear how difficult it can be. And that makes sense when every municipality has different hours or different time frames. That makes it very difficult for them. I, and I can understand that. The other thing I, I just wanted to highlight is they, they were clearly suggesting a um, licensing type program for landscapers. Obviously, maybe there's some of that is self-interest too, but, you know, that they, but they did say, and to their credit, they did say the licensing locally or countywide should include a requirement to do some type of education along with it so you know about uh, about about you know doing things a little bit differently uh going through some type of education program on on um you know concerns with noise and emissions and other things that are going on used to pesticides things like that um so if you're going to do something that's more green across the board that might be a direction they were they've clearly reached out to like the county executive and other agencies, and, and you see some of that in their literature that they provided. Um, their preference from the association would clearly be to license landscapers and potentially to require that they do some advanced level of education in order to get the li their license. Yes, and from what we've talked about as a committee before, I know 
a lot of the committee members have suggested that we do have an element of education with this. Um, and that's something that is uh, recommended in the guidance as well, because I do think that's an important part of it. Otherwise, uh, I don't know if people are going to follow it <laughs> because they won't understand. Yeah. So yeah, in this in this case, on his end of it, I think he was talking about education in order to get a landscaping license in a community. So mm -hmm. the land the, the landscaper, or at least the owner, was familiar with some of the green practices that they should be employing. Yeah. In the guidance, so I don't, I'm sure not everyone had a chance to look at it because it was just something that was finished today, really, um, as we were like talking about different elements of this. Um, and like I said, this isn't like a finished thing. This is like the beginning of our guidance. Things can still be adjusted. Um, but what we, I'm just going to kind of bullet, go over bullet points here. That way I don't have to read the whole thing. Um, this, the guidance suggests a time-based ban and also, and on the calendar, so, uh, and I'll go over that in a second, the exact dates. We know that Rybrook already has a noise ordinance in place. Um, that's, it says on here, 9 p.m. to 8 a.m. weekdays, 9 p.m. to 9 a.m. weekends, uh, and that does include the leaf blowers. So that's what's currently in place. Part of what we are suggesting is to um, change those hours for leaf blowers from, to do the same as Rai did. They have theirs 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. on weekdays and 6 p.m. to 10 a.m. Uh, on weekends and holidays. So it sort of leaves a little bit more time at the end of the day for residents to have some more peace and quiet. Um, it's not that different, you know, the weekday isn't that different, um, but it would align with uh, what Rai is doing their hours, especially on the weekends, it would give a significant amount of extra time to residents who want a little bit more peace and quiet during the months uh, when we do allow leaf blowers. So, um, as for the dates that we have suggested, um, it is a restriction on both gas and electric. And my, I know we went back and forth on this all, quite a lot. <laughs> um, as I just mentioned, one issue, one of the biggest issues probably with doing a leaf blower restriction is enforcement. I've talked to so many different people on committees that they have really strong restrictions in place, but they're not enforced. Um, so I was thinking like, make this as easy as possible. You know, don't try to make it complicated because if we do that, it's just, it's not gonna happen, you know? So in the spirit of keeping it, you know, simple, it was like, okay, I don't know that people are gonna be able to tell the difference between their neighbor two doors down doing electric versus gas, I don't know. You know, and it's like for the police to have to come out every time to see if they're doing electric or gas, it, it makes it kind of complicated. Um, and so it's just easier to have that time-based restriction. And during those times, so um, in New York, really it's October through, when is it? Um, so leaf blowers cannot be used May 1st uh, through September 30th. Um, and really the October is when the leaves start to fall. Um, and even the landscaping uh, nonprofit, they were talking about, yeah, you know, there are certain times where like, that's where the leaves fall, that's where you're going to get the accumulation, but also we're giving a period of time immediately afterwards of about a month um, in case people don't clean up all their leaves, if they still need to do, you know, some cleanup, it snows, whatever, they need to remove it. It's like they still have the opportunity to then use the leaf blower should they need it. Um, and so that's kind of our thoughts on like the dates is to make it only to let people use leaf blowers when they're really needed, but not for like blowing dirt around, not for blow blowing grass clippings, not for, you know, blowing trash, which I also see a lot. <laughs> so it's like, we're limiting that, which could really be done with, you know, a wide head broom. Um, so trying to get people to use those practices during the rest of the year versus doing all the blowing. And then there is an exception, um, and this is pretty common across the board uh, with places that have uh, restrictions in place. Is you know this would there would be exceptions for municipal entities, schools, 
uh, religious institutions, clubs, golf courses, hospitals, retirement communities, cemeteries, uh, people and people that are doing driveway and road paving ceiling activities. <laughs> so it's like, you know, um, so there, and also one thing that um, was suggested that we have put in as well is that uh, the, if somebody needed a permit to use leaf blowers, they could go to the village of Rybrook and they could get a temporary permit, seven day permit for a $35 fee. Um, and that would be used for things like abandoned, ne neglected properties and temporary work sites. So any questions about that so far? I have a question. Yeah. Why are municipal entities um, exempt? So that is a good question. I think it's more, and I do address towards the bottom, because um, I put a little star next to it, because I do think um, what I suggest is, I said, although we have stated in our guidelines that municipal entities would potentially be exempt from restrictions, we believe the village of Rybrook should participate in restrict, restricting leaf blowers whenever possible. This would reduce noise pollution and have a beneficial environmental impact. And through leading by example, the way our municipal buildings and parks are maintained can act as a model for residents. Um, so even though, we're saying that they technically are exempt, we would still hope that they would participate as much as possible um, within that. And I do understand the criticism from residents of like, well, why can they do it, but we can't, you know, I do understand that because <laughs> that's what I hear a lot too. Um, and of course this is all open to like, you know, it's just something that I saw across the board uh, with other municipalities that have done this, they, they tend to exempt them for whatever reason, so. I could, I could uh, to touch on the kind of things we do now. <clears throat> you know, what do we use? What do we use the blowers for right now? It's pretty much in our parks. Um, but mo like, for instance, like our tennis courts, things like that. You got we we only have three people. And in the summer, you're probably down to two with vacations and everything. A lot of the time, that's when they take the required to take vacations in different periods like that. So th a lot of it is our tennis courts, you know, in certain areas of our park. We're not sitting there blowing all of we're not blowing the grass in the parks that's for sure um but it's more just to clear off to get it get it cleared off and get out of there that's really what we're using it for so to sweep it just would take too much time to do stuff like that um the the in terms of the enforcement bridgie you want me to just talk about the comments from greg so mm -hmm. you, or you want to do that oh so so greg's greg uh, our police chief greg austin made he, he's very you know he said not a problem on anything that's proposed he made a couple of suggestions. One is, you know, don't indicate non-emergency number. They'll just call the police. Just say call Rybrook Police. They'll either call. He said, I really don't care if they call nine one one or the non-emergency. <laughs> you know, it's not like they're doing it in a storm. It's going to be <laughs> where there's a lot of calls. You know, he said it's fine. Uh, the warning would be a problem, like giving warnings. Mm -hmm. You know, you may want to either, either we'll have to come up with a talk to the board and come up with a policy how strict they want to be at first. They may want to do it you know, a warning for the first week or something or the summer, whatever it is, they'll come up with a, a process, but there's no way to track the warnings, especially when they're out in the field. The police are turning over on, on shifts and the, guy, and the people are on the car. So if they see it, they really wouldn't know whether or not there's been a warning in the past. So it's not like it's collected that way when they, when they do give warnings. And then lastly, he just made a comment that he's heard from other police chiefs in the county. Just an interesting thing for those communities that allowed electric, they what they've seen landscapers start to do is they get generators then, and then they're plugging these uh, things into yeah. the generator. So now you got a generator running in somebody's property instead, which is probably worse. So oh yes, I forgot about <laughs> that. Um, I forgot to yeah. mention that. That's a really yeah. That was <laughs> one of the things that like blew our mind in the meeting is that they were saying yeah that people get really loud gas generators and they're giving off even more fumes which is not what we want to do <laughs> no no so just a few comments and so yeah so those are all um that's good input to know on the enforcement because again, i think that's one of the things that we have really struggled with is how is this enforced and i don't think any of us want to like be finding people left and right and like you know going around like oh here's a ticket here's a, you know um so i think one of the biggest parts of this would be really education like uh, one thing that i had put in towards the bottom again in the additional notes 
is implementing some sort of mailer that goes to every single house um, that goes over like the calendar, the times, just like very simply tells people and also alternatives to blowing your leaves like leaf mulching and um, all that sort of stuff. So we could make something that's very simple that everybody would get um, and hopefully read <laughs> so that people aren't confused about what to do. And it would be great if the uh, flyer was bilingual too, in Spanish as well as English. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, I know I, I have somebody that can translate it for us, but I don't know if the village does as well, if they have somebody that works. We would go on, we would go to one of our staff that, that does it, but we're, if you have somebody who can do it easier, that'd be great. Okay. Yeah, definitely have it um, in at least English and Spanish. Um, I'm just going over making sure I didn't miss anything here. So yeah, the main points of this is it does, uh, it does go over, it does feature both gas and electric blowers because again, like Chris mentioned, there are issues with allowing electric and we'd have to, it would be very complicated to word out all the ways you couldn't use electric if we, you know, because people will find a way, you know, they're smart. They'll be like, okay, let me figure out how to get around this. Um, so, and also a lot of residents, their main concern was really the noise. They don't want the noise. They want it peace and quiet. Um, and so electric does still make noise. And, you know, even the newer gas blowers, actually, some of them make the same amount of noise as an electric one. So, um, yeah, but, and so the time when leaf blowers would be, per be permitted is October 1st through April 30th. And again, it would be uh, 8 a.m., it would be 8 p.m., or 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. on weekdays, 6 p.m., what is, oh, no, I'm sorry, let me read this. Uh, between 6 p.m. and 10 a.m., you couldn't use it. I'm sorry. And between 8 and 8, you also could not use the uh, leaf blowers. So I, was, I got that wrong. I was saying you could, but you can't. <laughs> I don't know if anybody wants to use a leaf blower from 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. That would make it even worse. <laughs> so, um, so, yes, it's mostly during the daytime, you know, <laughs> is when people can. But we're also giving, because right now with the noise ordinance, it really goes, a little bit past daytime it goes into the nighttime like we're going until 9 p.m um so we're just trying to stop that a little bit earlier i don't know if people have suggestions on other times we'd want to try i mean this isn't really altering the noise ordinance that much and this would only be for leaf blowers of course but um that was just this was just one that we had immediately put in because it's what rye uses so but you guys jump in one second just a couple things uh real quick is that the first thing I just want to kind of um, address the point of our entities being exempt because again I can definitely foresee for the public that being again a source of criticism but I did have a conversation with Michael Nowak who did come to speak with us before as 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 did Paul Vinci and they are the and the superintendent of public works um, as well as our DBW foreman respectively but in addition to as our administrator said that there's only a couple of them are always constantly on the move. So they really, again, as soon as they're done with one task, they're hopping onto another task. And that's pretty much their day in, day out routine. They're, they virtually almost never sit still, these guys. And the other thing is, I just had a conversation with Mr. Nowak earlier today. And what from, he told me is that the vendors that he gets pretty much most of his equipment from, and again, and he is in supportive of the transition. It's just that he said the infrastructure for them from those companies is there that are not putting up those products like for electric that he would like to buy. Now he is looking to do that in the future. Um, it's just that those vendors, from what the conversation I had with him, it just has not um, has not made it, made it a priority, at least them themselves, to kind of put electric um, like equipment, including leaf blowers, on the market. But again, at that though, I do want to hear from everybody here in terms of your thoughts on all this. Again, this is a group um, discussion, so I, I would like every single one of you to give your input or concerns or questions that you may have. And that's it for me, because I want to do as, le as little as talking as possible for myself. And again, this is a first step So we're trying to just lay out the first step, you know, that we can always amend this in the future. We can add things, you know, we can change things. Um, but I, I think we've talked about it for a really long time. Um, so it's just getting started with something at this point, you know, 
even if it is something that's really simple. But if any of you have suggestions on how to make it even simpler or how to, you know, create something that would work better, definitely open to mm -hmm. ideas. Just, just to tag on to what Greg said, the um, just we we all agreed that this would be a study year to look at electric type of machines and material and equipment. Um, but I could say it's it's going this direction. So I'm I would anticipate we'll have some pilot equipment out there in the next budget year. I expect you know even though change is difficult, but you know that sometimes you have to adjust to it. So you know we're looking to. Next year, we're looking to at least start on some pieces of equipment to do to make some changes. Yeah, and especially so one thing that I actually didn't <clears throat> put into the guidance um, is replacements. And we had we had touched on that before is, you know, if, if it happens, so happens that one of the gas blowers stops working, well, let's replace it with an electric one then versus buying another gas. Um, so trying to kind of slowly but surely replace the equipment and maybe mm -hmm. at some point we could even get a grant um for electric equipment um because it is expensive so yep and i think did everyone get the uh guidance that i sent out? i hope i sent out the right i know i accidentally sent out one that had that included uh lawnmowers which lawnmowers are not included you guys it was just it was accidental that part so <laughs> if you have that one that's just the older version um i'll send out the updated version again just in case you guys need it uh robin did you or michael i i got both you did yeah. send the updated oh you did okay perfect no, I, I, I got them. Assuming there's general support for what we're doing, what are the next steps? What kind of happens? How do we anticipate what happens from here? Um, I guess, what are the next steps? Because it would be, in my mind, it's getting it, like putting it forward with the village, you know, having media, like meetings that the public can attend about this, right? And then getting any input from the public, then yeah, finalizing I something or... Yeah, I think the next step, because this had been referred to the Sustainability Committee for Report and Recommendation, the next step would be for this committee to, to submit that report and recommendation. And then we would add it on as a discussion. I, would it be a discussion item, Chris, first? Yeah, we would start as a discussion item and, and then we just, the board would have to would discuss, should we hold some public education meetings or just draft legislation? How, you know, which way to go as the next step? So the first step is, like as the mayor said, you know, submit the, the report and recommendation from the sustainability committee. We have the information from the Landscapers Association as well. And uh, my guess is that the board, you know, the board would want to put it on as a discussion item first. And assuming everybody's on the same page, the next step would either be a public education or be part of a public meeting where legislation would be drafted and then there's public hearings on it. Yeah, and a full disclosure. I don't know what the appetite of the full board would be for this legislation. I know you've got two former sustainability committee chairs on the board. Uh, so I would hope that we'd be able to move, move this forward. <laughs> sure. And just then a procedural question, assuming we're good with this, do we have to, as a sustainability committee, approve it at the monthly meeting? Or can this be, again, assuming people liked it, would we have to wait a month? Or is this something that could be approved by sort of an email vote of the of the committee? Greg, so, so basically it's just the committee should take an action, which would just be, is everybody comfortable with this? And, and it doesn't have to be overly formal. You know, take a vote on the, on, the, uh, on the report and recommendation. And if that's it, then Greg will just forward that final report and recommendation onto the village to the village board to put it on the next on, a, on an upcoming agenda. It's that simple. Not gonna not looking to complicate things. Right. So it's not required to be an in meeting vote. Bridget, if she got some suggestions, could circulate it and then ask. It for should people. be. I mean, it should be at the meeting. I mean, okay. but you have a meeting right now. I mean, technically, you could do it right now if you wanted to. I'll just jump in here too. So now that we're no longer subject to the open meetings law, we don't have like the rigid like structure and rules um, that we would have to follow if we were subject to open meetings law. 
So like the regular board of trustees or ARB board or, or zoning and planning board, they have to have a, meet, have a meeting uh, in person, or again, now that the executive order is expired and now they have to meet in person. But again, we, um, unless stipulations say otherwise, um, then you have to have a quorum as well, but we don't have to do that. It doesn't have to be anything super formal, as long as again, a majority of you agree. Again, of course, we hope to have consensus where uh, we can get all 10 of you, because there's 10 active members. Uh, to support any proposal that goes uh, formally before the board. Um, but again, if we don't figure this out right this night, this is not something we have to wait another month um, until the October meeting and to, to um, kind of decide what direction we want to go in. Thank you. The board just wants to know that this is the consensus of the majority of the, of the sustainability committee. Yeah. So the information is more important than, than the method at this point uh, for, the, for where we are right now. And just as a quick question, sorry to change the subject a little bit. To be clear, this is this is very similar to neighboring communities. Well, yes, this is it, very similar to Rye. It's very similar to the Rye, but the thing is, is that it's not similar to what's happening with uh, Port Chester or Greenwich. Mm -hmm. Port Chester does not currently have a leaf blower ban in place. Right. Um, at all. I know I talked to Kiki, who is part of the Port Chester uh, Sustainability Committee, and they're just, um, I mean, they, they just don't have the ability at this point to push this forward like they would want to, because um, they're trying to do other programs. You know, they have a lot on their plate. Um, so it's not that it might you know, it might happen at some point in the future, but not for the foreseeable future, I don't think. But and someone yeah, but someone prepared a really beautiful um, spreadsheet, Mayor. So if you wanted to, you know, one of us well, could I've, I've send seen it to that you. sheet. I'm from okay. I've seen the sheet. I just, um, but I, I just wanted to, you know, more so just want to make sure that we aren't just going our own direction, that it's, you know, that it's based on what other municipalities have successfully done is more so is more so my concern because then it's in it's easier to be able to defend the decision yes um so the suggestions that uh we're proposing are really in line uh with what most of the communities that have restrictions within westchester um are doing if not it Ours is even a little bit, a little more simple than a lot of theirs. Some of them have extra stipulations. Um, so we've like, like Rye, for instance, they limit uh, gas lawnmowers as well and other gas uh, yard equipment. Uh, we're just focusing on the leaf blowers for now, but it is, otherwise it is very similar uh, to what they're doing. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no, I just, you know, again, I just want to be able to, you know, we, we, any decision that we make, obviously, there's, you know, going to be people on both sides of everything, and there's going to be some upset people by, but we, we just need to be able to defend the decisions that we make and say, well, this is, you know, we're not reinventing the wheel here. This has been done in other communities successfully, and so we're giving it a try in Rybrook. Yeah. And by the way, I'm very happy to be seeing this coming as a report and recommendation because when I was chair of the sustainability committee, I came before the board of trustees with a leaf blower ban. And this was probably more than 10 years ago and was summarily dismissed. Yes, if I yeah. can jump in. Times have changed. Um, and to, to the mayor, to your point. So and the, the reason to be the main impetus behind wanting to hold the meeting with the landscapers in the first place is to kind of preempt some of that. So to my understanding, when we did this last time at a public hearing, like 40 of them showed up and were pissed and not happy. Um, so the meeting that um, you, that we had together, that was to avoid all that, to um, kind of hear their concerns. They can hear what we're doing. And also, again, opportunity to make clear to them, look, we're going to do this. So it's not like that no one's going to try to talk us out of it. Um, but one of the things that I also plan on doing, once to also all of you guys can agree on what you want to submit formally to the, uh, the Board of Trustees, I'm also going to share with them because it does have to go on a public hearing. And that's the case anytime we change a, a local law, we have to have a public hearing. And so I will share with them because I'm pretty confident they're going to show up to it. 
as they did last time. Um, so they seem to be pretty uh, on top of the game when it comes to knowing what one community is changing their laws. So yeah, and that's all goes into just making sure we hear the different stakeholders as much as we can. Now, just to be completely honest, are we gonna be able to please everybody? And the answer is no. Um, but um, we, of course, do the best we can to try to make sure we reach out to all the different stakeholders. But at the end of the day, some people are just not gonna, are gonna be unhappy with it. But truth be told, there's not really much we can do to satisfy everybody. And I'll turn it back over to you, Bridget. Yeah, so, um, and last time that we did propose this, uh, I know the, many of the members were there. Uh, there weren't not, I think there were only like two towns in Westchester that at that point had a ban in place versus now where it's actually like the majority of Westchester towns um, have some sort of restriction or ban at certain points of the year in place. So we're, you know, as far as especially lower Westchester, we're one of the few that doesn't have anything. Um, so it really is, I think the landscapers realize that now and they realize, like Chris has said, this is the future. You can't stop the electric, you know, from switching to electric because that's just what you're going to have to do. So we're not trying to reinvent the wheel. We're not trying to inconvenience landscapers. Um, they already have to follow these rules in Rye. You know, if they service anywhere else in Westchester, they're pretty much having to follow these rules. Um, so they already have the equipment, you know, they already you know, follow these rules when they're blowing and they know that, that certain times of the year they can't do it. So um, I think they understand a little bit more at this point and they don't have as much of an argument about it. Can I ask a few questions or just um, specifics really? But one is why would we go through April and not stop in January if we're really thinking about the leaf season? Um, yeah. That's question number one. No, that does, that makes sense. So the, really the only reason I did that was to align with Rye. Um, my thought on why they did that was to give residents who haven't cleaned up after fall, for I guess a long time, uh, the ability to do that or like early spring cleanup or something, but I'm not sure why they have it going so far, but I thought just, to keep it simple and do it, do the same calendar dates that they are for landscapers so that they're not having to, you know, follow two different calendars when we're so close to one another. But um, I agree, I'm, I'm not sure uh, why they did that. I'm pretty sure you're spring, right with that, that it's spring, spring cleanup. The spring cleanup. Um, because it's also before the growing season really starts. So they're not mowing yet. They, they're not really going to be sitting there mulching things. Mm -hmm. The, um, and they, the, yeah, I, I would say the other thing I, I, you might want to consider if you're not acting, I don't know if you're going to act on it tonight or not, the report and recommendation, but it might be worth reaching out to a few of the larger HOAs because, you know, Rybrook is a little bit unusual from other communities in that many of our residents are um, within HOAs, large HOAs, and it might be worth reaching out because in those, a lot of those cases, they have one vendor who's serving the HOA. So it might just be worth having a discussion to kind of head that off too, to flush out any concerns that they may have. Just a thought. Well, I was actually thinking of that living in the arbors that we recently hired a new um, landscaper and I think they have like, like a year contract or I don't know what it is, but <laughs> in some ways, um, if there was something in, I don't think that the Arbor's board would necessarily care, but when they're re-upping a contract, it would be important to know what is required. Mm -hmm. That someone's not gonna get a big contract like the Arbor's unless they're willing to have uh, electric equipment. Yeah, That's or, you don't, or, or you don't wanna see them say it's gonna be an additional cost now or and there's an existing contract, something like that. No. Yeah. No, you're right. That would be a big issue as well. I do know that from the last time we proposed this, the Arbors was against it. They were one of the few residential groups that showed up and they were we're very against it. Um and their their uh concern was we're gonna have to spend more money. Um which from we have I have talked to um 
different people in HOAs. I've talked to people, you know, individual residents um, and also businesses uh, that are following the ban. And overall, uh, people have said that they really haven't had to spend much more money. If so, it's been like a small increase. But I think that's kind of inflation now, like everything increases. I don't know if you can blame, you know, doing electric. Um, because before, when we proposed this the first time, there really weren't as many companies offering electric, offering, you know, these alternatives. Um, so you would have to like find a company that did that. They would have to buy the equipment. So they would charge you way more versus now they're servicing all of Westchester. And a lot of these places already only use electric or they only do it during these certain times of year. So they already have all that in place. So for them to charge more to use something that they're already using, <laughs> It doesn't well, we make heard, as much sense as it used to make. We heard, that from, we heard that from the Landscapers Association because we said, is there an additional cost? And they kind of said, no, they have to remain competitive is what I remember them saying. You know, they had to, they have to stay competitive. So it's really difficult to do something like that. Um, I would, you know, to have different price structures like that. The, um, <clears throat> and I would mention, Rye's not the only one that does spring. If you look at the chart that was prepared by, um, by our by the intern that we that we had over the summer they you can see a lot of people have a spring cleanup time period it varies in what that length is but there's a lot of them with the spring cleanup yeah i have another question i know on the arbors facebook page and on the rybrook residence facebook page a lot of people have had issue with the rising electricity costs huge rising electricity costs do you think that we may have to really sell it because they're going to hear electric, that there's going to be um, more electricity used with the charging. Not that I, I hope that I would be one of those advocates in the arbors, for instance, to say mm -hmm. this is a, a less polluting option, but I do think that the cost of electricity might turn some people off right now in this time. So, um, oh, sorry. Can, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I was just gonna say in the restriction guidance, we actually don't separate gas and electric. They're both banned. Um, true, true. And that's a, that's what rise, you know, they, um, most places don't, there are a few places that do allow electric, but most ban both during a time period versus allowing electric, you know, all year or whatever. Um, so that might be a second phase to this, you know, at a later, like we get people used to not using it during a certain time of year. And then we phase in another step of, you know, um, allowing electric or a lot, you know, exactly. in other times. I think, I think that would be an easier sell because that would almost be, you will save money if there's less leaf blowers being used, is it really that necessary? Because and what the landscapers said too, and we'll send out their um, their information again as well. I know um, Greg actually sent it out. I think uh, this morning, um, they mentioned a lot that you know there. It depends on the machinery. It all depends on the machinery people are buying and using. Because like they said, if you're using a gas generator to power your electric leaf blower, or you're, you're, it's worse than you just using a gas leaf blower. You know, so it all depends on what's being used and how it's being used. Um, and it's, you know, we can't tell people, oh, you can only get this model and this one, and you can only do it, you know. So it's, it's hard to enforce that, which is why at this point, I, we had just put in electric and gas, like you said, because otherwise it, it gives people another obstacle to cross. Exactly. Um, and maybe that's something that at a later point we can phase in as electric becomes even more. Can I make a suggestion that our proposal to the board has those phases in time frame? So year one, this is what we recommend, you know, in 2023, starting with this, and then in 2024, we move to that, and then in 2025, whatever those time frames are, you know, this is where we want to be, so that the legislation that they enact actually gets us to where we want to be, ultimately. I don't think that, that we should recommend that they pass something now, and then another year, they have to go back and amend it, and then amend it again. 
Um, and to that point, um, going back to what Chris said about, I think it was Chris about enforcement and how the police aren't really able to track warnings. I think that it, it would probably be, I mean, Rybrook is a really nice place to live. <laughs> and it probably would be nice to say like year one is warnings, you know, year two, the fine start and really give, you know, residents a chance to get used to it and landscapers a chance to get used to it without automatically penalizing them because they feel like we don't want to be a community. You know, we're not out to get the revenue, right? Our goal is not to raise revenue, like, you know, giving speeding just so you can garner revenue. The idea is to limit, you know, protect the environment and, and the health of the residents and to limit the, the leaf blowers. So can, I think that- Can I just you ask know, you for I, clarification? Cause I kind of like that idea cause it's very clear. Everybody the first year would just get a warning so that if the police saw someone use it, they would warn them. So it's, isn't it possible someone could get like 50 warnings? You know what, it's possible. It's obnoxious to think it, but they it, could. It, it is, but it's, it, I feel like it's better than, than the first time they show up finding somebody. And I just, you I, know, I, I agree. I not agree. Really a very nice community and it's not a welcoming community to have that type of, you know, you, you move into your house or you find and you don't know and boom, you're, you're fine, $100, $250. I just- I also I, think I, you're making it easier and more manageable for enforcement. Because if in the year 2023, everyone gets a warning and that's what you're telling the police, they don't have to be questioning, okay, in the records, who got a warning, who right. didn't. But then in 2024, even if you just moved in, understand that's a fine. But at that point in time, right, somebody who's moving in later, you know, then that's that's up to them. Their neighbors are going to know. They're going to find out. You know, and the other issue is I hear what we're talking about in terms of being consistent with Rye, even though I recognize that there are other neighboring communities that, you know, are not necessarily consistent. But I, I do feel like the 10 a.m. on the weekend feels like a really late start, whether it's a landscaper or whether it's a homeowner who wants to, you know, get something done in the morning and then go about their day. Um, we don't restrict the other noise regulations at, until 10 a.m. And it didn't seem like a lot of the other communities were, were doing it through 10 a.m. So anyway, just, just a thought again, in terms of, I, I, I hear how we're trying to be consistent with Rye and I, and I recognize that for the landscapers, it's easier. And in some ways it'd probably be easier if there was a county law, you know, that covered everybody. But in the meantime, I just think the 10 a.m. also is, you know, so far, I, I think it's very far removed from, you know, you can have renovations in your house and banging and construction and all this stuff going on, but you can't use a leaf blower. Yeah, that's a great point. And that's kind of uh, what we had talked about before with not trying to repeat the noise ordinance and make it redundant. Um, because right now, and it's really only an hour difference. So I think it's, what is the current? Uh, so it's 8 a.m. you can start on weekdays, 9 a.m. on weekends. Uh, so you can start a little bit earlier uh, currently an hour. So we could always align ourselves just directly with the noise ordinance mm -hmm. and have that, or, you know, or have it not yeah. in there at all. And it literally is just, <laughs> you know, yeah. Unless the noise ordinance, for whatever reason, needs to be updated, and I'm not proposing that it does, but it does make sense that as a municipality, you know, that we are consistent if we have the ability to, and the opportunity to be consistent, and there's not a really strong reason why we can't be consistent with our own ordinances that are already on the books. I completely agree with that, and I, I um, yeah, I think that's a great point, is there's other equipment that's going, so why are you limiting right. uh, the leaf blowers? Okay. Yeah. Can, I, my neighbor's, you know, doing a major renovation, and they're drilling, you know, <laughs> into yeah. the rock in the ground, but I can't, you know, blow my leaves. Yeah, no, I totally agree with that. I think maybe we can come to a consensus on those sorts of things and amend uh, the guidance some more. Um, but I also agree with, you know, we need a time period for warnings, whether it's a year, six months, whatever. Um, I don't know if, I think honestly, the fines are a little bit excessive. If I'm being honest, $100 and then $250, I think that's a little bit excessive. 
I would propose maybe $50 and then $100. Um, just because, like you said, there are some people that will unintentionally break in we and of course this is up to Rybrook PD to also use their own judgment of like do they just want to say hey just so you know you know like I'm not sure if you're aware like did you just move in or whatever and like not give them a ticket um but obviously if there's a person out there that just doesn't care and they're like no like I'm going to use it whenever that's different um but if somebody genuinely doesn't know and they have a neighbor calling Rybrook PD on them and they get a you know ticket we don't want it to be like such a large amount that it's like oh my god like <laughs> i just didn't know so um like it is you know 50 dollars is still like it, you know it's a fine it's it's something mm -hmm. um but you know for a lot of people i mean depending it's like 100 250 dollars that's a lot of money you know so so the fines also, I mean, potentially, again, if, if we were to, to propose something in year one and year two and year three, and maybe even in year four, you know, that's when the fines could increase as well. You know, the first year, you don't know, just warnings, you know, and whether it's a year, whether it's six months, I mean, it feels like it should be a season. But um, the next year, you know, you're going to be fined, you know, the, the year after the fines are actually going to increase and that's going to be the flat level going forward if we feel that we need to, because you do want it to be enough of a deterrent that people will change their behavior. But I do feel like, again, I we're a friendly community. I'd like us to be a friendly community. I don't want people to view us as a punitive community. Well, yeah. you know, I don't disagree with you on fines, but just noting that when we looked at the levels of the different communities, what you have is the lowest level of fines that any community with fines currently has. So it's not out of line with what other people are doing. It's lower than some communities. Again, doesn't mean we can't make it lower, but I just wanted to point that out. Yeah, and um, one thought that this is just like off the top of my head is that we could have like some sort of exemption. Like if somebody proves a hardship that they can't afford this fine, that it could be, you know, knocked off. I just worry about certain people that do their own yard work or whatever, getting these fines that just, yeah, they just can't afford it. And it being like a really prohibitive amount uh, that I think that would really upset some people. So I, I would rather have it be less because I understand, you know, Rye and these other places have, you know, high fines for this sort of thing. Um, I don't know if we need to be that heavy handed necessarily because as Debbie said, it's like, we're a friendly village. We want people to be happy. You know, we don't want to be giving out. <laughs> and we're not here. We're not doing this to make money. You know, it's not to make money. It's to create a, an environment that is hospitable, more hospitable to people, you know, that's quieter. Um, so people can enjoy their weekends and that they don't have fumes going all around them and everything else. So if I could just make one comment, the I wouldn't get too hung up on the fine amounts either or the I think it's a very interesting discussion about whether the first year should be warnings or not. Um, I think those are good policy questions. The issue is realize when the police department goes out, they always have some level of discretion, you know, and they know the ones that are going repetitively to by, you know, from history, you know, we do that now, you know, we know the ones that shovel the sidewalks and don't shovel the sidewalks and, and the ones that don't repetitively and we keep having to do it and that becomes a safety issue they're going to get they get tickets you know and and other cases you know they just maybe haven't gotten out there so there's always some level of discretion the police will use but um but the policy the or the recommendation that you know whether or not to issue fines in the first year or six months or month whatever you guys decide is all i think that's all really good discussions do you happen to know you probably don't off the top of your head what are the fines for like somebody not uh shoveling their sidewalk um i don't remember off the top i have to look it's a it's um i don't remember off the top no no it's fine i, I didn't yeah. expect you i was just you know you never know <laughs> some people remember like numbers i i can't either um no, we have the issue is the ones in the five the license and fee schedule i know more but these are those are not that's one i think that we and a lot of times the courts end up reducing them anyhow. Okay, yeah. They do go to court if they fight it. I, I, don't, I don't think we'd want to be like 
if the fines like whatever uh you know twenty dollars or something we don't want to be like oh it's a hundred dollars for the leaf blowers but it's twenty dollars if you don't scoop your ice off you know or whatever or no, anything off. anything <laughs> locally we can we can you we can we can uh, come up with a fine that's as long as it's reasonable, obviously. But you can develop a fine for a local code ordinance violation. Generally, it's never going to exceed two fifty. Uh huh. And, so, and I doubt it's twenty dollars either. Yeah. <laughs> I really doubt we have anything that's twenty dollars. No, exactly. <laughs> How about this? We make them volunteer in the butterfly garden. That's the fine for the first year, <laughs> and that's how we keep this going. We get enough like people like that. <laughs> And then we have like years worth of volunteers. <laughs> That's a very good idea. Like that idea yeah, and they can choose the second year, either doing the garden or paying the. <laughs> I think that's a great idea, actually. <laughs> I mean, honestly, yeah, we need the help. I would rather have them volunteer for a day than give us the money. I mean, I don't know if the village agrees, but. <laughs> I agree. No, I agree. I don't, know if we can, I don't know if we can legally do that, but. Um, <laughs> But at least uh, since we have the mayor here, Mayor, can we just get your thoughts and some of the ideas for the fine ideas that were just being tossed around? Mr. Mayor. Um, you probably uh, had to step away for a second. Uh, okay. But again, again, I want to hear from everybody here. So we have Brandy, Frank, Sheeho. If you have any comments, please um, feel free to chime in, everybody. Again, this is this is the point of this debate is that we can uh, make sure everybody can address any uh, comments or questions or um, input they want to have. Because again, we want to definitely want this to come from the, the entire board. All these ideas. And mm -hmm. we're having a great debate tonight. I'm very happy with this. But again, I want to make sure that everyone gets to have their say. Sure. You, no, I I realize I'm in the minority. Um, with this group, I I do not think that it makes sense to ban leaf blowers altogether for certain periods of the year, um, especially for people like myself. And I know I'm being selfish here because I'm thinking about my own property, but you know we have a lot of trees, and so leaves um, you know come off the trees all year round, and um, you know, not all leaves land in the grass. So if um, I'm just thinking if, uh, you know, I'm not allowed to use like uh, an outside vacuum, a leaf blower, what I'm probably, if I, you know, and it's just impossible to be able to sweep up this many leaves, especially when you have, uh, you know, a property that's just larger, is I'm probably gonna use water, which, you know, is not a good alternative. Um, but that, so that's why I was thinking that it would make more sense to have a policy more like Greenwich, where it's um, less restrictive. Uh, perhaps we could head towards in the direction of the city of Rye, where it's more restrictive. But um, that was my thought. And I realize that there are concerns about the generator <clears throat> and, um, you know, uh, 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 landscapers using generators versus gas, you know, so what really is um, the difference in implementing a plan like this? But for me, um, I do know that the town of Rye has implemented electric in um, Crawford Park. And I know that they there was uh, quite a bit of um, improvement that they had to make. You know, they had to install a lot of plugs around um, the park. But um, I think for you know individuals who use a lawn service, um, I think it makes more sense. You know, if we want to garner um, more support for uh, legislation such as this, to have it be less restrictive with the goal that gradually it becomes more restrictive. Because I think that perhaps for something like this, it might be a little too much for some people. You know, um, for people who are in an HOA, it's probably not gonna make as big of a difference because, you know, they don't really have as much control over who's going to be um, taking care of their, their lawn space. And I realized that 
um, as far as pollution goes. Uh, we're looking at noise pollution, air pollution, air quality, but um, <clears throat> that was one of the reasons why I had thought that um, Greenwich might be a better policy because it limits the number of um, leaf blowers that are being used throughout the community based on the, the square footage of a property. And so that, you know, uh, people who might be a little closer to their houses, you know, I know that the noise issue might be uh, um, more, uh, the noise issue might be um, alleviated somewhat by limiting the number of leaf blowers, because I know that there was talk uh, tonight where they were talking about leaf blowers and well, does it make a difference <clears throat> with the um, sound is of an electric versus a gas? The answer is yes, there definitely is. Um, you know, I mean, I walk around, I can definitely tell which one is a gas and which one's an electric, not just by the emission of sound, but also by the smell. I mean, if my windows are open, I can definitely tell the difference. But I think that what Greenwich was doing by limiting the number of leaf blowers that uh, a landscaper can use, uh, that it would um, it would significantly limit the amount of air pollution, um, the amount of energy that's being used. It might be somewhat more of a hardship for someone who has a larger property that you know that. Uh, you know, or, or that, you know, maybe the, the leaf, the, um, the landscaper probably would take more time to be able to do this. But, um, you know, I just, I, I felt that Greenwich was probably a better way to implement things. You know, I just thought that Rye, um, their community is a little different than ours. And what I mean by that is Rye Brook, there are a lot of um, yards that are larger, and this is more um, with with Rye. There are a lot more people that are just more of like in a city setting than here, and so I just thought that implementing something more like um, Greenwich, that's a little bit closer to like what our neighborhoods are like, or you know something kind of similar, maybe even Harrison it may make more sense. But um, I do realize that there's a need for this and that, um, but I just wanna make sure that this is something that the community is gonna be okay with. And uh, just from, um, you know, talking with other people, you know, I obviously didn't say anything about what the community, that this committee is doing, but, you know, just from talking with people, you know, it just seems that they use a leaf blower a lot, um, I have noticed that more people just naturally are using electric more than gas, but I, I think it is important that if we want mm -hmm. something like this to be implemented and supported by the community, I think it should be more gradual. Okay. But th those, that's my thought. And I do realize that I am a minority on this committee. So, um, but, and I will respect whatever the, the committee decides. I'll just say one thing uh, real quick. It's just that um, okay. when we do the comparisons, uh, which is totally fine, I think it's the one that we just shouldn't use in the town of Rye, because remember the town of Rye, they only have the two parks that they're overseeing, which is Crawford and the town of Rye Park. So for them to transition over to electric, it's probably, they, they have, probably have it the easiest out of all the municipalities in Westchester. Because they, again, they, they pray the town council makes the decision and again, it's just for the parks and their employees, then that's it. They don't have to take into consideration everything that we have to do. With mm -hmm. that residents and everything else and we, but we did have a good session over there too where we learned about how they were doing that they're doing a great job with it um it's almost there for us but it's like they the length of time from their mowers and stuff is right on the edge for us in terms of how long they go but uh, they're doing some good work uh, and that's great you know i think that's a good thing um i think we'll be all going in that direction once the equipment is just was another step forward on that on the larger equipment Yes, and it's uh, it's definitely things to think about. And like you said, you know, people with large properties, um, you know, how do they deal with that versus somebody with a smaller property? Um, 
my again my concern is more enforcement with that like how do we know or how does how will the police know like who and i would also assume like if you have a really large property your neighbors probably aren't hearing the leaf blower as much because they're further away than like if you're right next to somebody else um so you probably wouldn't have as much reporting of that but um you know, I'm just trying to think of how Greenwich um, actually enforces that because I think it is based off of what I remember reading. It is like a square footage of it, or it's like a, it's the size of the land is how they do it. If it's under a certain size, you can't, but if it's over, you can use more than one. Is that how they? Yeah, it was just that if the property is, um, I think a quarter of an acre or larger, they can use more than um, one leaf blower. Okay. Whereas if it's less than it's one, which would make sense. I mean, um, you know, someone who has like a, a property that is like 0.22 acres, it doesn't really take that long to mow the grass and blow out the lawn. But, you know, for someone who has a, a larger property, it does, you know, and it makes sense <laughs> that, you know, there would be more than um, one leaf blower. But um, no, I think that makes sense too um because yeah i think that does make sense um and but we also have to think about people excuse me we also have to think about people who use the leaves not just for mulching their lawn but also for using it for um their gardens you know and how exactly are the leaves to be moved because if they're not going to be allowed to use leaf floors then the alternative is raking and um you know whether people will be okay with you know um raking you know like tons of leaves into gardens where there's it's like so much easier just to use a leaf blower and um you know what type of behaviors are we trying to promote by this legislation you know just i'm just thinking macroly of um you know certain issues and you know like i said though i will support whatever the the committee decides. I just think these are some things to take into consideration. Something just to consider, if you don't mind. The um, I just wanted to be a, one of the concerns, like quarter acre, half, half acre. I think that would be very difficult for the police to because we want something, one thing to put on the books, but we have to be able to easily enforce it. Um, to address some of Brandy's concerns, what about has there been any discussion with allowing like electric on hardscapes, like driveways or patios, things like? that people blow off, but only, that's easy to see, you know? If you're doing a driveway, you're able to see that and, you know, the police would be able to know that. But if they're blowing the grass, if that's what we're trying, you're trying to prevent, that's easy to see too, you know? So maybe that's something at least to consider. There might be a balance there on some of the issues like a hardscape. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Something. Throw, throwing it out for discussion, that's all. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I don't know if there's any other municipalities that do that, but it's certainly something to think about. You know, there's no reason why we can't do something a little bit different too. And so right now, yeah, so we have, I'm just going over what we proposed again, just to make sure. Um, I mean, we, we exempt, we exempt some of the larger places, like a, a golf course is exempted. I mean, those are usually pretty large. Um, okay. You know, retirement communities, cemeteries, they usually need the use of that. It does say, um, so religious institutions, schools and municipal. Um, we could consider like, I guess we could consider like maybe HOAs or places like that that have like a huge amount of residents together and consider that like one property because they are using one landscaper at a time or one landscaping crew to landscape it, I would assume. Um, maybe we could consider that part of the exemption is that if you are in these certain, you know, large communities, like a, a, then their landscaping crews uh, could potentially use, you know, more than one or they could use um, leaf blowers uh, during other times of the year, if they needed to. I, my personal opinion is that we hold them all to the same standards. I don't think that we should have one rule for homeowners who live in a homeowners association and other rules for homeowners who live on their own privately. Okay. Yeah, I think we need to keep it simple. Yeah. I'm pretty lost track. Yeah, that's always my biggest concern is just people understanding it and 
the enforcement of it. Um, you know, we another also thing. Oh, sorry. sorry. Go ahead. You can go ahead. Oh, just another thing to consider is that um, you know where are the leaves going to go, because if uh, they're not going to be blown out and you know gathered up. Um, are they going to plug up the the uh, the storm drains? Well, so you know, if and if that's going to happen, you know, that's another um, that's another issue just to think about. You know, because I do know that drainage is an issue here. So, from speaking with the Landscapers Association, they did advise that we do have a ban during certain times of the year, and that there are in New York there are times when the majority of leaves do fall. And that was uh, between the periods that we are allowing leaf blowers, whether it's electric or gas. So people still would be able to use them during the time period where most leaves are falling. Now there's always gonna be certain trees, I'm sure that are the exception that maybe lose leaves early, or if there's um, some sort of bad weather for that year where it's like super hot or super cold, like it could affect things um, and make it, you know, make leaves fall sooner. Um, at least that's what the Landscaping Association brought up, but um, we have it so that people can use leaf blowers from October 1st through April 30th as the suggestion. Um, so they could use leaf blowers for a significant portion of the year if they needed to. And anything else? I think this is also why the education component is so important and um because even for me my mulch mowing and leaving the clippings in place was sort of a new thing that Ashley introduced us to so um I I do think that having a, a really strong educational component in addition to the proposed uh laws uh, is very important um and especially if we decide not to enforce the fines uh, the the first year and leaving it uh, for maybe year two, I I don't think it's overly aggressive. I think Rye's been doing this since 2008. I'm not sure how successful they've been at enforcement, um, but I don't I I don't think this is overly restrictive <laughs> as as it's written right now. I know as of recently, they really started enforcing it from what I've been told by my friend who my friends who live in Rye. Uh, they told me that a few years ago, it wasn't really being enforced as much. Um, but now they actually have started giving out tickets and, you know, going around and telling people that they can't use uh, the gas leaf blowers or the leaf blowers during certain times of the year. So I think they are enforcing it now. Um, but And let me see what else we have. Uh, anything else, anyone? And I definitely think education, like you said, Shiho, is important. And we can also think about maybe some more ways, like Brandy mentioned, to phase it this in. You know, even if we do a simple approach to phase it in even more um, in certain steps, like maybe it that maybe it's not all at once. Um, we give people some time to adjust to things. Um, like we have the period without any fines, we have an educational period uh, where we advise people on like different ways that they can eliminate their leaves through leaf mulching, um, all those sorts of alternatives. Uh, and then we phase in, you know, certain times of year when you can't use the leaf blowers. Um, so, I mean, there's obviously a lot of different ways to approach this and that's part of the reason why this has taken us so long. <laughs> to come up with anything because I think it's one of those situations where we could talk about this forever and there's so many different ways to do it um and of course you know as Chris mentioned we're never going to make everybody happy <laughs> so it's hard because you have residents who are like they come up to me and they're telling me why why do you guys not ban leaf blowers yet like they, I've had I've had at least five people say why haven't you guys done this like I don't want to hear it anymore I don't want to and I'm like, well, we need the support from the community. That's what I always tell them. Like, we need to know that you guys want this, that you support this. Um, and then I'm sure there'll be other people like the HOAs that are like, no, we don't want this at all. We want no restriction, you know? So it's like finding some sort of balance that doesn't, you know, 
doesn't create chaos for everybody. And, you know, that's an easy transition. And I think, uh, you know, so many other places in Westchester have implemented this and it doesn't seem like it's created, you know, a huge obstacle for residents and landscapers to get over. Um, and it has been well received by a lot of people. I think especially within the past few years, there's a lot more people that uh, want leaf blower bands because they're, they have more knowledge about, you know, the noise pollution, the environmental effects. Um, so it is gaining popularity, uh, but you know, there's always gonna be people that are against it too. The gentleman say one thing too, then whenever we do come up with a policy, I mean, I think it's critical that for as many of you can, that can comment, and if you know any community members who support this, come to when we have the meeting for the public hearing, when we put it on the agenda, because then the mayor and the administrator can both attest to this is that, if we have one person in the audience, that's a lot. And so, again, we don't have one of a repeat like the last time. I mean, I wasn't there where, again, you have 30, 40 landscapers. And again, I don't think we're at it this time considering the outreach that we've had, but you don't want to have like 10, 15, or whatever, how many people coming out opposing to it. And those who support it, even if they're majority, no one's showing up. So just to give you an, an example, just on Tuesday, again, we had Stable Westchester come to explain the new power agreement. As I mentioned to you guys, and I'll talk about this later in the meeting, just to for the public and for you guys. Um, that put on the agenda to come and no, no, nobody in the public came to, uh, to come listen uh, to what he had to say. Now, granted, we, we do, um, it is online for everyone, for the public to watch, but these are the type of things where, again, we, we, we want to have public input. We want to have like the public come give questions um, as well as particularly when we have, when we put the leaf blower on, on the agenda, whenever we get down to BOT meeting and we, we have to have a public hearing. This is also when when we put something together that for you guys and the members of the public come out and to show why you support it to the board. And I know Ashley mentioned a few meetings ago and um, I don't think she's not here today, but um, that one thing about the last meeting is, uh, or one thing she mentioned is she that, you know, thinking about the residents, you know, they weighing them a little bit more than the landscapers opinions. Um, as far as like, you know, the Landscaping Association, they can easily get 40 landscaping or landscapers to show up because they do that, you know, that's what the association is for. Um, but, you know, I think we need to weigh the residents' opinions a little bit more than theirs um, as far as what they want. That's just my own opinion. You know, that's just my own opinion. Um, and also Ashley's, as she said before, but, um, you know, that's just something to think about. I agree with that. I agree with that. It's the residents. We're the taxpayers. Yeah, and I think that's up to the board. You know, when they hold the public hearing, that's up to them then to listen to um, the input. But what we can help with is certainly getting advocates um, of the proposed legislation in the room to, to be at the public hearing as well. I think that's something that the committee should be able to help with so that um, public comments at the public hearing represent a range of views and not just the landscapers because they have the, you know, the, 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 the size basically to, you know, to garner a whole bunch of people to show up. And, and, you know, I think we have to, as we're talking about the specific details and everything else, I still think we have to keep in mind that this is the way everybody's going. It's not really so unique anymore. And we see what's happening with climate change. Um, I think that, you know, we're going to continue getting less and less resistance to these types of things because I think there's recognition that we're moving in this direction. We have to move in this direction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any more comments on this before we move on to the electricity, the ESCO? And of course, we'll continue to have conversation, you know, out of uh the zoom meeting as we amend some of the things i've been taking a few notes but um if there's any more right now i i, I would just say you know thank you all for this this great conversation i think there's you've been you've been hashing out a lot of the issues that clearly this will face and i'm i for one am very happy that we're moving forward with this and I can't wait to see the report and recommendation. Thank you. 
Mayor Klein or Minister Bradbury, is there anything, any comments that you two want to make based on any everything that the both the two of you just heard on all the different proposals that are ideas that were thrown out there? No, I mean, I have nothing to add. I think it now just comes down to what the policy direction is going to be from the committee and from the board. Now, we're ready, willing, and able to, to move forward and help with the education and the enforcement and put it in place. Well, again, um, last calls. A anybody who has any comments or, or ideas they want to throw out there? Once, going twice. Okay. Well then, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Administrator, thank you so much uh, for your, both your time. You know, you both have very busy schedules. Uh, thank you uh, both for uh, coming to listen to the committee. And um, you, you, both of you, of course, you can stay on, but you're both free to um, get some rest because I'm sure you both uh, very much want that. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you so night. much for the invitation. Have a good night. Thank you good night. again. Bye. Good night. Bye. So right. um, we do have the electricity that Greg is going to mention as well. Yeah, I'll, I'll mention that at the um, at the end. Like just the uh, second next uh, thing, and we do it anywhere you want. But a couple other things that we have on the agenda, and Bridget, again, you can discuss it anywhere. We have the um, proposed again with uh, in coordination with Port Sustainability again another seed swap exchange. Uh, so yeah, we'll talk about that. I can go over this really quickly. So as you guys know, we did a seed swap uh, last fall. Uh, that was really successful. Lots of people came out um, and people asked for us to do it again. Port Chester Sustainability Committee reached out and they said, hey, we'd love to do the event in conjunction with you again. Um, so when I spoke with them, uh, they suggested doing a seed swap at the library, which is where we had it before. Um, on October 29th or 30th, and also offering some different educational workshops like on leaf mulching, um, you know, different things that we promote, composting, things like that. Um, and so we thought that might be a good idea. You know, it is a, it's basically a free event for us to put on that a lot of people from the village and from Port Chester attend. And it's a good way to also get the you know other programs to those people to get them that information um because otherwise a lot of them aren't aware about you know the composting that we have for free they aren't aware of you know uh our recommendations for leaves so it's a good way to like get people's foot in the door because they want to get free you know flowers or whatever so and it's just fun uh, you know even a lot of children showed up uh they were bringing their parents because they wanted to start a butterfly garden so it was like, a, it was a really sweet event, you know, it was nice. Yes, and I'll just jump in real quick too. So we had it like in April last time at the Porchester Ryberg Library. And again, it was very successful because again, it had the perfect amount of foot traffic. So, and I, I don't, it was very rare that there was a time when there wasn't somebody at um, the table for either Ryberg or Porchester. So again, I just if the committee wants to do that again, I'll be happy to make the arrangements and again contact the library. I know they'll be happy to have us again. Um, and I saw the banner that I bought from a banners on the cheap website, which again the best banner deals you'll ever get. So if anyone wants to buy a banner, um, again I can tell you it's a good place to go. Um, but so again, I'll just throw it out there to all of you. Is that something that you guys would be interested in doing again? I think it's a great idea. And we can also talk about the butterfly garden and see if we can start generating interest in helping to maintain a butterfly garden, plant and maintain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can uh, maybe print up some materials and have it ready for people to take and sign up for things or for if we, if we happen to have a volunteer date at that point, uh, promote that. I think that'd be a great idea. So yeah, we're trying to add more facets to this because we didn't we didn't know, of course, last time how many people would show up. We assumed like, oh, you know, we'll get a few people. And then of course we were like swat, we like just there were just like people everywhere. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is crazy, you know. So um we learned that it was very popular. People like it and they enjoy it, which is good. <laughs> All right then. So that I just want to ask um, logistically wise in terms of supplies, do you have everything that you need, Bridget? In terms of like, like the seeds itself, and all these other plants. 
Um, I think we're going to need more educational materials. Um, I can contact Healthy Yards again to see if they'll send us more for free. Okay. Other than that, we're collecting seeds, so I don't think we'll need much else. All right. So again, just um, to get back to me whenever you get the answer from them, because we just want to make sure we have all the resources available, of course. And I think the date that you were sending out the 29th to the 30th, is that about yeah. right? All right. So we... then, then what I'll do then, again, unless there's any objections, is um, I guess I can ask the library to put tentative down, like starting on a Saturday morning. Yeah, and we checked their calendar and they didn't have an event going on during those days. They do have some right before, the weekends before, um, but it looked like they didn't have anything on the calendar for the 29th or 30th. Um, so hopefully it's available. I'll, I'll call, I'll double check with them on tomorrow just to get an idea of their schedule is, but I'll see what they have like on Saturday morning. So that way, again, we can um, do this nice, not like super early, but Again, we're probably starting at late morning to early afternoon. That way, everyone can also can enjoy their Saturday um, going I, the rest of the day. I so have what, what time are we thinking then? To start with? Right. Um, yeah, and I'll throw you guys in late morning, so maybe 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock. Yeah, I think we started at 10 last time yeah. from what I remember. Okay, like and 10 until like two. I think it ended like at two, 2 or 3, like we went 10 to 2. I can look it up, uh, but I think I'm it was 10, 10 to 2 maybe. Okay. Can I ask a quick question? Um, and this might be naive, but do we have an email list just for sustainability, not the village's email list of village residents, but for the sustainability committee? I had a guess, um, I'm gonna assume no, that in terms of, uh, are you referring to if, like if people are like, subscribed to the email but, list for our committee? Because as we, if we have something, you know, we might wanna collect names and email addresses um as we're doing these kinds of events and then when we have information and things that were going on you know perhaps the committee can send out i don't know how that works as an advisory committee to the village um how that would work and whether we could do that but it may be a possibility because you know as we're looking for volunteers to maintain or plant you know or do any of those kinds of things we have a list of people who we know are already interested who may not be on the villages um list so just a thought no it's a, 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 a thought I and mean, it's something i can definitely run by um i crit um just again our, our administrator as well as um our it person just okay it's not you know it's no problem to um you know maintain even an excel spreadsheet you know uh a list of email names and, and email addresses as a way to you know contact people i just don't know again how that relates in terms of this being a village committee. If there's people outside the village, you know, we have Porchester residents and that kind of thing coming on. Yeah. But, yeah, but no, like it's something to think about. And again, I'll, something I'll run by Mr. Bradbury as well as our IT person just to see uh, what their thoughts and the suggestion are. So thanks. Again, that's, that's, so don't worry, my end. All right, so does anybody have any additional questions, thoughts, considerations regarding a seed swap? No. Nope. Okay. So then we'll move on to our next topic. Um, I know Debbie, you requested this one regarding Healthy Yards Tour. So I guess I'll let you discuss it in terms of potentially putting that together, the uh, logistics of how that would work. It wasn't, uh, did you say me that I suggested it? In the email I got. The, the compost ad is what um, I... Yeah, my yeah. Yeah. So I, I think we've talked about this before that the county has, and I'm sorry, I, I turned off my video because I was eating because I needed to eat dinner. <laughs> but um, the um, county has opened Compost Ed and they provide tours and it's it's basically showing how municipalities or, you know, various, it's basically showing how you can do composting on a small scale. And I think it would be really valuable if we want to go as a committee, you know, to organize a tour, we can go as a committee, we can go and invite our elected officials to come with us just to take the tour there. I have not had the chance to do it yet, but it's basically education about composting and showing how you can, you know, not needing a lot of space, create your own composting sites. Um, and it's located in Valhalla and they'd be very happy to give us tours. So I just wanted to know one, if there's interest in the committee. Um, and this is when we had the um, earlier presenter, I forget what 
they were food cycle. Is that what it was called? Um, that's what reminded me again that we haven't actually done this. But again, more information about composting, how we can increase the composting in our community. And I am happy to coordinate a tour for us if there's interest. And if there is interest, then we just need to understand evening. I guess it probably have to be a weekend is my guess. I don't know if people could do daytime. So just get a feel for some times that could work, you know, for the committee to go over there and see uh, what's going on. So anyway, I'm just throwing it out there if there's interest to let us know and then we can go ahead and organize something. Yeah, I think that'd be great. I know, I think uh, other people have even brought up going to, well, is it the, what is it called? The Wilburator? It's like some, the incinerator one doing like a group trip the there. This is actually in Westchester County and it's new and it's a smaller, it's not a huge thing like wheel abrader. It's to really show how you can do very localized in your community composting okay. as opposed to transporting up to wheel abrader, which would also be a good, you know, field trip. <laughs> yeah, so I think there definitely has been interest before. Oh, go ahead, Brandy. So it, it, what's the name of it called again? It's called Compost Ed. You can look it up, Ed like education, E D. Okay. I you know you can Google Westchester County Compost Ed and see a little bit about you know what it is. Um, and again, they've been giving tours. I actually wasn't couldn't remember where they had already started opening it to the public because it was in the works for a while. And happened to see Peter McCart, who's director of uh, sustainability at the county, and or emailed him and said, "By the way," and he's like, "Oh yeah, they've been giving tours for a year." So. <laughs> um, Anyway, I think it would be fun. I think it'd be worthwhile. And as the village is exploring, you know, other ways to encourage composting, I think that this would be really helpful. And I think it would be appropriate for the village. I don't know that Chris has been there, but the, for the village manager and for the trustees to come. But I don't know if we'd want to go first and then we want to arrange a subsequent tour to bring them on board, if we want to just all go together, um, if we want to partner and, and plan it with, you know, Portchester committee or, you know, whatever you all think. Um, I just think it would be a, a good thing to do. And I'm planning to go even if you don't want to come with me. So yeah, no, I think uh I don't know if we have something that we could maybe send out a poll to get like dates and times or you know that people could actually or if or if maybe we ask them for a few different dates and times that we could do a tour and then we get people to vote on like when they're actually available um, I guess if we want to join. I guess the question is for the people that are still on the call, are, is there interest? Are you interested in moving forward and trying to find a time that works? Yeah. Yes, definitely. It sounds great. Uh, just a couple of questions I have, um, Debbie, is that one, is that, is there a cost or is it a free tour in the second okay. one? No cost. Okay. We have to get up there to Valhalla though, but no cost. Okay. And the second one is, is that, is there like a limit and amount of people can go at one given time? I do not know the answer to that, but I will find out if we have an idea of how many we are. I mean, I suspect that we're not going to be 30 people. So um, it, is, it is an educational facility. That was why it was built. It's a functioning operational facility, but the purpose was for education. So, you know, if we, if we have such demand, then we can offer two different times and we can split up the group. It looks like they offer large groups too, because it said interactive tours available for school groups. Yeah, I mean, that's a, it's it's designed for education. I mean, that'd be something that I'm, I definitely I'm fully supportive of. Again, just you know, this is my own personal recommendation coming from me only. Is it just to find a time that works best for the committee as a group? And then again, then we can say the I'm happy to invite the trust uh, trustees to see if they can we can accommodate them. And in Portchester, but if we're going to invite Portchester, because again, the more people are inviting, the more complicated it's going to be logistically to schedule it. So if we get a date and there's tell Portchester, this is the time you're coming. If you can come, great. But if not, um, then they can come on the next time. I think that's an excellent way to handle it. So I'll move forward, um, reach out to them and ask them, you know, when they give tours normally, how long it takes, you know, get the logistics and we can get a few dates um that are possibilities potentially and see what works for the group 
Anybody else? Have any daytime and weekend because I'm assuming people work during the, the work week and wouldn't be able to take the time to do this during the work week. But I mean, for me, well, again, I, it's, it's what you guys, for me, it wouldn't matter because again, I can always justify being out of the office to do that as far as my educational program. <laughs> but again, it's <laughs> again, that everybody like, else's work week. Yeah, like I said, it's up to you guys and when you're um, accommodation wise in terms of when you guys can fit it in. Yeah, thanks for the great suggestion, Debbie. It sounds like it'd be awesome. Okay, good. Does anybody have any input right now in terms of time, you know, that you might be available? I would say, oh, go ahead. Who else was? Um, I was just going to say, I usually like to do things like that, like a little bit earlier in the day if I can, especially on the weekend, just because I want to be able to do other things. So if it's like midday, it's harder for me just because I usually have plans and I'm like trying to get things done. So it's usually easier for me if it's either earlier or later, like late in the day. So <laughs> was like probably don't stay home until late. If we could do like a 10 a.m. or something like that, 9.30, yeah. 10 a.m. the weekend. And I don't know how long it takes, but figure two hours start to finish, you know, getting up there, touring, asking questions, and then, you know. Yeah. Okay. All right, I will check in with them and see what options we have and and you know how many openings they have and so on and so forth. And I will get back to Greg. Thank you. Thank you guys. Okay. So nobody else has any concerns or questions regarding this? So I can move on to our final official topic uh, on the agenda. But then again, I will ask you guys just to remain on after we open the agenda, just to go over a couple of things just in personally with you guys. Again, so this is just more of like a public service announcement. So um, on Tuesday, as I mentioned earlier, we had uh, sustainable washers to come back to explain the new ESCO because again, I'll, I'll, we've been getting calls um, quite often uh, regarding the confusion that many residents have with it. So I just want to clarify a few things to the best of my ability. Again, I'm not sustainable Westchester. And the presentation that he gave is on our, uh, our village website. So you guys can feel free to watch it. And I recommend that you do. Um, but I just want to start with a few things. So everyone is automatically opted in on, unless you choose to opt out yourself. Again, so the, for this period, I think October 17th, when you can opt out. Um, but again, but it doesn't mean that you're locked in for uh, the two years because it is a two-year contract. So it is it goes from November 1st to October 31st of 2024. And I will just acknowledge as everyone else, as the state of Washington did, yes, it is um, much more expensive than our last ESCO, but um, it's the energy prices are, are more expensive everywhere in the world now. Uh, so Con Ed just put out a press release for, for, I mean, for those who are kind of residents who should have gotten it yourselves. And they've notified municipalities that they are ex prepare for heavy price increases on their ends. But again, it is an optional program, but the benefits of it are is that it is a two-year fixed rate, so they cannot, um, yes, the um, Constellation, which is the new uh, provider, again, this is all electricity only, it has nothing to do with gas, they cannot increase prices during the two years. Again, if, if you opt out as um, a different ESCO, um, uh, whether it be the kind of or anybody else, is that uh, they can increase it over the next couple of years to pretty much to, to their liking. Um, and yeah, and this pur other purposes of this problem, so they watch the program is to promote realm renewable energy. But again, you can opt in or opt, opt um, back in or opt out at any time, but it just may take, according to what we were told, like a billing cycle or two. Now, I'm not entirely sure how long that would take because I live in your town, apparently, but we are not part of the program, so I'm really not sure how long, uh, but maybe a, a month or two, depending on how long the program is. But again, don't quote me on that because I'm not 100% sure. But so again, if you, you're not married into it, but if you do choose to opt out, it just may take a few weeks for just for everything to be processed. How do you opt in or out? Is it just like a phone call? Do you call like a certain line or do you, do you go well, to a website? Letter, you all should have gotten the letter um, that specifies all that. But uh, to my understanding, to start with, there is something in the letter that you can mail back to that says, okay, uh, you can choose there, but you can also go on the website. And let me see if I can just pull it up here, if I can find it. I may not be able to, but let me at least. If you don't do anything, you're automatically opted in. Yes. So don't read those kinds of things that come in your mail, which I didn't when I got this year's, you know, whenever the last contract was. Um, then you automatically are opted in. You know, you opt in automatically unless you specifically read it or know about it from one of these information sessions or anything else and 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 decide to opt out. And you can opt out at any point in time. 
So, you know, if you are, if you opt in because you didn't realize something and then you choose to opt out later on during this two year period, you can opt out during the two year period. You're not locked in. Yes, as, as, as what I, as I summed up for you, you, you can opt in or out at any given time. Well, let me just pull it up the processor here. I'm just going to share my screen. Just bear with you guys. And Greg, while you're pulling it up, thank you for the meeting information and re for recording it. I had gone to Sustainable Westchester when they had some information ses sessions previously explaining the program. Yes. Yeah, so and, um, I was. I don't know whether they mentioned it at your meeting, but something that I found very interesting that I don't know how, how much they want to publicize it, but um, it was a little confusing to me, is that if you opt into the program, additionally, there's two different rates. One is the rate for clean energy, and one is the rate for, um, I don't know what you're going to call it, standard energy, standard. Or, um, not necessarily coming from clean energy sources. And those prices are different. So um, the clean energy price happens to be a few cents higher. A couple of like 15 cents per kilowatt. Um, so it's just interesting for people to note if they're paying close attention that you could actually opt in to be part of the program, but within the program pay the lower rate if you choose not to actually get your energy from clean energy sources. Okay, everyone see my screen? This thing's going crazy. Can everyone see my screen? See opt in, opt out. This is one way you can do it. So again, it, it may take one or two billing cycles. You just choose a municipality because Rybrook is in, so I'm just gonna go. Okay, Rybrook. that's pretty straightforward. Yeah. And then enter in your calculation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's where you can go. And I'm, I'm just gonna do it again because I just, I did it to get it situated, but you guys didn't see it. So programs, I shift to power. Opt in, opt out, and then just go on to the bottom. If you're in Con Ed or NYSEC, nice most of us, hey, most of us here, it's Con Ed. And then you go on to the bottom. You could do it that way. Or again, you can call them, email them too. But again, that's just the way, quick way you can do it yourself. And when does it take effect again? If you just automatically? November 1st, you should start seeing it in your payments uh, sometime in December. Okay. And it goes into October 31st of 2024. And I know one of the things last time that me and Greg had already talked about is um, there were a lot of people that expressed uh, they, at the time they were, they weren't aware that they were being signed up for the ESCO. And because energy prices shot up a lot um, around the same time, a lot of people associated the ESCO with raising the price of their bill because people were getting, you know, double the electricity bill or whatever, but it actually wasn't the ESCO. It was just, that's like across the board that um, energy prices had been raised. And I think it was also a really cold winter um, that year as well. But um, maybe this time around people- The chart in it, they show, everyone's look at the chart, it's all kind of rates the last like 12 months, the average has been uh, smaller, but it's, uh, again, and Nick T. Job, Sam Westchester definitely explained it better than, than I could, um, but, so again, like I said, please watch the video uh, from the meeting. That again, that's not going to take. That doesn't take into the expected like um, huge increase in Con Ed's rates um, too, because Con Ed, Con Ed, and it's not negotiable. All the ESCOs, no matter which one you choose, again, I can 100% guarantee you, you're going to see an increase in prices. Um, again, so and this is not just a, a problem here, Ryberg or Westchester. This is a problem throughout the world. Again, a part a lot of it is out of our control. So one thing he didn't mention, which is geopolitical reasons. So I think the biggest example of that would be, as, as um, Sam Westchester mentioned, is that we have the war in Ukraine. So uh, unfortunately, Russia happens to be a major energy supplier. Um, so as a result of not buying their energy or their gas anymore, um, we're now we're competing for a smaller energy supply. So that causes the rates to go up um, at a higher rate. So again, that's just something that's out of our control. So again, Con Ed, they haven't, they, have, they haven't told us what the price increases will be, but they are prepping us in advance for the winter that look, you're gonna see a, a price increase. So again, again, the, the, the benefits again, so event to permit rule energy and meant to lock you into a fixed rate so that way you don't get price increases over the next couple of years. But 
make this whole one make this 100% explicitly clear. It's your choice if you want to stay in the program or not. Perfect. So maybe we should gear up with some uh, educational materials on how to save money on electricity during the winter, like different <laughs> things. I don't know. You know, there's always different methods to um, help with that. So we can always do some social media if, posts. If you guys have any questions yourselves, again, you can tell people, which is what I'm going to start doing now, refer, watch the video, because I've gotten my fair share of calls and okay, okay, the video can explain it. And like, you can explain Perfect. it to Westchester County. Great. Okay, so unless there's anything else that anyone wants to um, raise or any questions or concerns that we may have, that will conclude our agenda. Um, but again, I do need you guys to stay on just for a little bit, but um, I will stop the recording if, if that's sad. No, nobody else has anything. So we see, I'm assuming that's now. Okay, so um, thank you for the public that we watched us there for tuning in. Again, I will have this published in due time as fast as I can, and um, I'm now going to end uh, the recording and I will go into um, an informal executive session with the community.